conference. We're going to focus on, on diffusion modeling in this session, and our first speaker is going to be Yuchin Wu, who joins us from, from Morton uh, at UPenn, and she's going to talk about posterior sampling uh, via spiked, spiked models. Hey. Yuchin, take it away. Sure. Uh, so thank you so much for the kind introduction, and also thank you so much for having me. So today I'm going to talk about my work on using diffusion model to draw post samples from the posterior distribution of the spike models. So during the process, if you have any questions, feel free to stop me and we can discuss. All right, and this is based on drawing work with my PhD, a PhD advisor, Andrea Mohanari. <laughs> Sorry. And okay, so I guess we have this diffusion model session on the first day, but since it's already three days away, so I'll just give you a brief recap here, just in case you forget. So diffusion model is like a generative model. Um, and what is a generative model? So in the context of a generative model, we are given like a target distribution. So here we have a, like a bunch of um, images of courses. And we are also given like training data from this target distribution. And our goal is to use this training data to construct a generative model with the goal to sample from the um, target distribution. So uh, we have many generative models. Prominent examples of generative model include GAN, oops, GAN variational autoencoder, and also the diffusion model that we are going to talk about today. Uh, so diffusion model um, has become e increasingly popular these days, and it has achieved a state-of-the-art performance in many applications. For example, image generation, text generation, and speech synthesis. Um, so to describe a diffusion model, we'll need to introduce two processes, uh, the forward process and the backward process, a reverse process. So in the forward process, we'll start from sample from the target distribution. So here we have an image of a horse. And at every iteration, we are going to add a small amount of Gaussian noise into this image until we get random bits. So the reverse process is the process that we'll use to draw samples. Um, so in the reverse process, we'll start from random bits, which we can always sample. And at every iteration, instead of adding noise, we'll apply some sort of denoise. And hopefully, at the end of this process, we'll get an image of our horse. Okay. So that's the pipeline for the diffusion model. And the goal of the diffusion model is to construct everything appropriately such that the output of the reverse process it's roughly speaking going to have the same distribution as the target distribution. So that's our goal. All right, um, okay, so now we have this forward process and this reverse process. The forward process is very simple. It's just like we add a bunch of noise to this process. Um, the reverse process looks a bit mysterious because obviously we cannot get an image of a horse out of nothing. So the magic under the hood is this, um, score function, which is defined as the gradient of the log density. So basically, at every denoising step, we are going to apply this score function in some way such that we can achieve this denoising. Okay, uh, so that's basically all I want to tell you about diffusion model. And since this is like a physics conference and probably not everyone here knows statistics, I'll also uh, say a few words about Bayesian inference. So Bayesian inference is like a very popular framework in statistics. Uh, so the goal is to like estimate some sort of parameter and we'll assume this parameter follows a prior distribution mu. So given this parameter theta, um, the observation x is going to be generated according to some probability kernel p of theta and we get this observation x. And the goal of this whole procedure is to draw inference of this parameter theta based on the observation x. For example, one popular goal is to draw samples from the posterior distribution, which is defined as the conditional expectation of theta given x. Okay, and I'll, okay, so the last piece of preliminary uh, I want to show you is like the definition of this spiked matrix model. So in words, a uh, spike matrix model is just a low rent matrix observed through some noisy channel. Um, it has lots of applications in practice. For example, if you consider the context of social network, 
a spike model can be used to like identify clusters of nodes that has a similar structure. And it also has applications in collaborative filtering where you can use um, the spike model to recommend items to users based on the similarities with other users. Okay, so formally speaking, um, we'll consider this spiked weaker model, which basically you can think of it as a symmetric version of the spike model, although like our results are generalizable to like non-symmetric and multi-rank models. But for the sake of simplicity, we'll consider today only the rank one symmetric case. So under this symmetric model, we observe this X matrix, and X is just the sum of beta over n theta theta transposables which you can think of it as a signal and a noise W. And this beta is a positive scalar which represents the signal to noise ratio. And this theta is a, like an n-dimensional vector. Uh, and we'll assume the entries of theta are i, the samples from a prior distribution pi of theta. So pi of theta without the loss of generality, we'll assume it has unit second moment. And this W is a noise matrix that follows a GOE distribution. What does it mean is that W is symmetric and the off diagonal entries are ID normal zero, one over N and the diagonal entries are ID normal zero, two over N. Okay, so uh, with all these assumptions, it's not hard to at least get an expression for the posterior distribution. So if we denote the posterior distribution by mu X of D theta, then this is going to be proportional to this function, but of, of course up to a normalizing constant. So the challenging thing here is that we do not know how to compute a normalizing constant, which is like a high dimensional integral. And another thing I want to comment about this distribution is that if the problem scale n is very large, then this is like a n dimensional distribution. It's like a high dimensional distribution. And another thing is like a for typical choice of the prior distribution pi of theta, this distribution is not going to um, have the good properties we desire. For example, it's not going to be log concave. So in the sampling literature, this means that this is like a challenging distribution to draw a sample from. And the main question we are going to ask today is, can we approximately sample from this distrib posterior distribution of the spike model in polynomial time? All right, and before I get started, I want to like present you several interesting phase transitions related to this spike model. The first one is an information theoretic one. Um, so basically this is like, um, there exists some information threshold beta it. So uh, that such that um, if the signal to noise ratio beta falls below beta it, then in this case, it is information theoretically impossible to draw inference about theta. Uh, or in other words, in this case, the posterior measure is going to be very close to the prior distribution. And the prior distribution recalls just a product distribution. So in this case, sampling is going to be very easy because it's always um, easy to draw a sample from a product distribution. And the second phase transition I want to talk about is this um, BBAP phase transition, which basically says that, okay, if beta is larger than one, then we can just use spectral method by taking the top eigenvector of this metric matrix X, and this already gives us some non-trivial estimation to see that. Um, and I'll also give you a very, very quick recap of the sampling literature on this problem. Um, so when we speak of like posterior sampling, perhaps the first thing that will come into a statistician's mind is to um, run some sort of MCMC algorithm. Um, so for this problem, like a very popular MCMC algorithm is the Gibbs sampling algorithm, uh, also known as the global dynamics uh, in statistical physics literature. There are some theories about this Gibbs sampling algorithm, but unfortunately the current theory only covers the case where beta is less than a quarter, which uh, usually falls below this information theoretic threshold. That is to say, it's like not a very interesting regime to draw a sample from. And another popular class of like, uh, a popular class of method for doing approximate Bayesian inference is based on variational methods. So variational methods is also very nice. There are many beautiful theories regarding it. Um, but the problem is like, 
variational method does not directly lead to assembly algorithm. Okay, so the class of sampling algorithm we will be talking about today is based on this stochastic localization process. Uh, so what is a stochastic localization process? It's just a SDE that we assume is initialized at the origin and is defined as dyt equals to myt dt plus dbt. Yeah, and here this myt is defined as the conditional expectation of this theta conditioning on x and the t theta plus gt equals y. And here bt and gt are just the standard Brownian motions. By solving this SDE, it's not hard to see that um, this yt is equal to in distribution to t theta plus gt. And a very nice property of this stochastic localization process is that um, if we consider the normalized wall system distance, which is defined here, between the target distribution mu of x and the distribution of this random vector m y t t, then the square of this wall system distance is going to be upper bounded by the inverse of t. So this property is very nice because it implies that if we can track this stochastic localization process until a very large t, then it says that it basically means that we can like uh, approximately draw a sample from the target distribution by outputting this m y t. Okay. Um, okay. So before, so that's the stochastic localization. So before I proceed, uh, I'll pause for a moment for, because you probably want to ask. Okay, at the beginning of this presentation, you talked about you want to like um, design some sampling algorithm based on the diffusion model, but now you are saying this stochastic localization process. Um, why are you doing that? Um, I'll skip the details of this slides, but the key takeaway here is that um, stochastic localization process and the diffusion model, at least the most basic version of the diffusion model, they are kind of equivalent up to a change of time. So uh, in the following, I'll just uh, talk about diffusion, uh, stochastic localization process. Okay, so back to, sure. Can I ask a quick question about the theorem that you quoted on the few slides ago? Okay. So can you explain the tuition for why the guarantee is here in process time? I guess I would expect that you would use guarantee in process time if you're sampling with an OEE, but when you're sampling with an SDE like this, it seems maybe more natural to use guarantees with KL and TE. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess the intuition here is like, yeah, I guess like if you, cons because like here this stochastic localization, yt has this spectral structure, so you can somehow imagine, okay, this is like not a rigorous proof, but the uh, intuition is like you can imagine like you can use this yt to construct some sort of estimate to the posterior mean. And like posterior mean, uh, you usually come up, come with like some L2 guarantee. And the L2 guarantee also implies a worse than distance. I guess that's like um, one intuition, but it's not like a rigorous proof. Uh, all right, so back to our stochastic localization process. Um, so this is the process, and I guess one natural attempt to like um, this to construct an algorithmic implementation of this <coughs> stochastic localization process is based on Euler discretization. Um, so our approximation process, of course, is also going to start at sorry, start at the origin. And it will consist of capital L steps with step size theta. And for all lowercase l ranging from zero to capital L, we'll compute this m hat y hat l l theta, which you can think of it as an estimate of the counterpart without a hat. And then we'll draw a w l plus one from a standard Gaussian distribution that is independent of everything else so far. <coughs> Uh, and with this W L plus one, we'll update Y hat L plus one as Y hat L plus M hat Y hat L L delta delta plus square root of delta W L plus one. And finally, after all the iterations are completed, we'll output this M hat Y hat capital L L delta, um, and we'll denote the distribution of this random vector by a new X L. Okay, 
So that's going to be the algorithmic implementation. So I guess its form already explains why it should be thought of as like a reasonable approximation to the stochastic localization process. Um, and our main contribution of this project is basically to provide a theoretical guarantee for the framework that we proposed. So that's our main theorem. Uh, it basically says that uh, under some sort of conditions, um, here our condition uh, on the prior distribution pi theta is it should be either discrete or has a density. And this density like satisfies this condition. It says that the second derivative of the log density should be upper bounded. Okay, so if either one of the two conditions code and also uh, we will say there, are, there exists a pair of constants, beta L and beta U, that is a function of only the prior distribution, such that for all beta larger or equal to beta U or beta smaller equal or than beta L, the following statement is going to be true. It says that for any positive psi, there exists a combination of capital L, delta, and M hat, such that with high probability, if we consider the worst system distance um, between the target distribution and the output distribution, then this is going to be upper bounded by psi. And this holds for, holds for arbitrarily small psi. Yeah. Sure. No, <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah, I'll do that in the next slide. Okay, so now you see like this theorem is stated like under like a disjoint set of conditions. So for the interest time, I'll only focus like on one possible combination of the conditions. That is, I'll, in the following parts of the presentation, I'll assume pi theta is discrete and the signal to noise ratio beta is large enough. In the other cases, um, we'll have to like design different M hat, um, but the, I guess the idea is similar. So um, I'll just consider this one case for the interest of time. Okay, so for this case, um, yeah, like as you said, I haven't told you anything yet. So we'll must, we have to like first introduce like how do we construct this M hat. So the algorithm like we'll be using in this case to construct M, this M hat is based on this approximate message passing algorithm. And this AMP um, is then constructed based on this scalar denoiser F sigma, um, which is defined as the conditional expectation of theta conditioning on gamma theta plus square root of gamma G equals Z. And here, this theta and g, they are independent of each other and has marginal distributions, pi theta and standard Gaussian. So it's just a scalar denoiser. Um, it's nothing uh, complicated. And the algorithm we'll be using is called base AMP with spectral initialization. And to be a bit more specific, in the first, um, in, the, in the beginning of this algorithm, we'll take um, this new vector which is the top eigenvector of this matrix X, and we'll normalize it properly such that the Euclidean norm of nu has, um, uh, is equal to square root of n beta square, beta square minus one. Uh, and the AMP algorithm is just an iterative algorithm that proceeds as follows. Um, so this algorithm is going to be initialized at nu, and at every iteration, it will um, conduct the following updates. And uh, of course, here, these updates depend on some constants, alpha tk and the btk, and I haven't told you what are these constants. Uh, there is like a iterative definition for these constants. Uh, I guess you don't really have to look at the specific form. The only thing you need to know is alpha tk and btk, they are just the functions of t and pi theta. Okay, so that's the AMP algorithm. And AMP algorithm has like a very nice property characterized by the state evolution. So what does it mean is that uh, for every fixed K and T, if we like take uh, any pseudo Lipschitz function psi and we take the average of this psi applied to theta i, z, t, i, k, then this quantity is going to converge in probability to ex expectation. So this is like a very known property of the AMP, and the point is that we'll use this property to like get our consistency result. 
so what does consistent result mean is that if we run the AMP algorithm that I just told you in the last slide for sufficiently many iterations, um, then this is going to give you a consistent estimation of the posterior mean vector MYTT. Okay, uh, so this is just a consistent result. Um, yeah, so uh, now let's revisit a little bit the stochastic localization framework. Um, I guess by looking at this uh, framework, like it's kind of natural to think that if we want our algorithm implementation to give a good approximation, then we have to have three desiderata. The first desiderata is just this posterior mean consistency, uh, which I just showed you can be achieved by implementing an AMP algorithm. The second um, desiderata is this pass regularity, which basically says that if we consider this stochastic localization pass MYTT, then this pass has to be like smooth enough such that if we apply discretization to this pass, it's going to give us a reasonable approximation. Like if it is wiggling a lot, then, then discretization will not help. And finally, um, because like we are doing this discretization and we are using this M hat instead of M, so inevitably we are going to cause some error here. So the final, final desiderata basically says that, okay, uh, this M hat, it has to be kind of not very sensitive to input perturbation because like if it is very sensitive to input perturbation, then a small amount of like input noise might cause you a very huge change. So that's something that we do not want. Okay. All right. So um, yeah. So so uh, I'll briefly talk about like how do we prove like each of the decelerata. Uh, the first one I've just shown you can be achieved by AMP algorithm. The second one um, is very simple. It's basically based on the observation that this MYTT uh, is a martingale and we can apply all sorts of martingale concentration inequalities. And the final one is a bit trickier um, and the proof idea is based on a reformulation of the AMP. So recall that this is the AMP algorithm and we'll, uh, an equivalent formulation of this AMP algorithm is to write M hat T K plus one the k plus one's iterate of the AMP as a function of the previous two iterates and yt. Okay. Um, then we'll introduce uh, transformations, gamma and psi, and basically we'll define this p as this psi inverse applied to m. And we'll show that uh, if under this p parameterization, AMP is going to be a contractive mapping and like after like doing a bunch of change of variables, so on and so forth, we are going to be able to show like the whole AMP algorithm is going to be like robust to input perturbation. So that's the idea of like proving the third, <coughs> third desiderata. Okay, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's the proof. Any questions so far? <laughs> Um, yeah, so here, like if you look at our main theorem, um, our results work for like either beta small enough or beta large enough. Uh, I guess, uh, of course, like we do not have an explicit formula of how small this beta L should be, this, how small this beta L should be, like is like has a complicated dependency on the prior pi theta. So that's something that we do not share. And this beta u, uh, the high SNR regime is something that is not covered by the global dynamics result. Is there a reason why there's an intermediate regime? Uh, yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, the reason we have this gap in the intermediate regime is like because um, in the high SNR and the low SNR regimes, we employ different algorithms to estimate this M hat. And um, 
like each of these algorithms only cover like a uh, high SNR regime and low SNR regime, and there is an intermediate regime that we do not know how to design an algorithm for, or at least we do not know how to get a zero to a guarantee. Uh, yeah, uh, like um, I guess the higher SNR regime, regime, the answer is not like that. The higher SNR regime is like because the AMP parameterization trick I just uh, told you only works when the SNR is high. Uh, like in the low SNR regime, of course you can also like reintroduce this reparameterization, but it's not clear like how to show it's contractive. So uh, if no question, maybe we can proceed to the uh, experiments part. <coughs> sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I would imagine like if we simply like apply a change of time, is that what you mean? Not a change of time. I mean, say, like a different scaling in front of G and a different scaling in front of theta, or maybe something where at, like as the noise enters, theta disappears or something like that, rather than having theta appear more and having the noise appear more. Um, I guess this stochastic localization process we use it here is because uh, this was not like a process that we invent. This was like um, studied by Rona Eldon at a bunch of like other probability papers. Um, so in their formulation, they prove many nice properties, and their stochastic localization process is like this various e exploding process. So that's why we use it here. But we do not believe there is a fundamental difference between like this formulation and the, the standard diffusion model formulation. So, yeah. Yeah, I would imagine like one possible distinguishing here is like if you want to analyze the convergence theory, the convergence theory is like what is like the non-asymptotic convergence rate of your diffusion model or stochastic localization process. Um, this different time scales might cause like a different, like a real difference in the sense that you have to choose your discretization steps like more carefully. But here, because we are only like presenting a asymptotic result, we do not, and we cannot get a non-asymptotic rate guarantee. So uh, I guess here um, the time scale doesn't really matter. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Can you compute theta ln beta u for an Nevada method required? Yes. Uh, so for beta. At, at least for the low SNR regime, the beta L is already given by a previous paper by Andrea and Mark and Almet. So in this case, uh, they prove that beta L is like, uh, I guess first they prove it's a half and then they extend it to one. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So here our assumption is like um, your posterior has to take, I mean, your prior has to take a product form. Yeah, and also it should satisfy either of the two conditions. The first one is, is discrete. So basically it's like has a finite support or uh, it has a density that if we take the log of that density, then this function is going to have like bounded a second derivative. So that's like the two conditions we require. Um, of course, we have to like assume that SNR is either very large or very small. Yeah, but we do believe that our algorithm still work in the intermediate regime. It's just we cannot prove things for it. I, I, I hate to interrupt all these nice questions, but maybe in the interest of time, I think you still have a few examples to show us, no? Uh, it's just like a very quick simulation study. No, no, but you uh, take your time, so just maybe you finish your talk and then we see if we have more time for questions after the talk or we take it offline. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll conclude very quickly because like the final simulation is very, very simple. Uh, so the, okay, so now we have like some algorithm that hopefully we can use it to draw a sample from the posterior distribution. But how can we verify it? Uh, so I must say it's very challenging to really verify that this is give, uh, giving us the correct sample because uh, posterior distribution is uh, like a very complicated object. And analytically speaking, <laughs> there is very few we can say about this distribution. Um, so I guess the idea for like evaluating our algorithm is like because uh, is to based on very simple functions of this posterior distribution. Because like if we restrict ourselves to simple functions of this posterior distribution, analytically speaking, we can predict it's, uh, at least its asymptotic um, value um, using some mathematical tool. Okay, so I'll start with the setup. Um, so in this experiment, I'll assume pi theta is like a uniform distribution over plus minus one. So uh, in this case, this problem is also known as the Z2 synchronization, and we'll assume N to be a thousand, and we'll take L, which recall is the number of discretization steps to be 500, and the delta to be 0 0.02. And, and for our algorithm, we'll run AMP with 20 iterations, and this is already sufficient. You can, of course, run more iterations, um, but it's not going to improve your accuracy a lot. Um, and we'll denote the output our, of our algorithm by theta alg. And for our purpose, we'll take the first 10 coordinates of the hidden spike theta and our output sample theta alg. Because this is like a synthetic experiment, so we know what is the, sorry, so we know what is theta, so we can take the first 10 coordinates of it. And then uh, after doing that, we'll compute the inner product uh, of this first 10 coordinates of the true spike and the first 10 coordinates of the theta alg. Um, in this case, because like we are comparing like projections of low into a low dimensional subspace, so we can actually get uh, like a theoretical counterpart for this value. So theoretical counterpart means that we can use some more messy tools to predict its asymptotic value, okay? And here is the simulation result. And this orange line, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but here is an orange line. And those orange lines represent the theoretical prediction of this inner product. And this blue histogram represents um, the actual values we get by simulation. So you can see that uh, it actually quite matches quite well for all values of beta. So these different plots uh, give simulations under different values of beta, although you probably cannot see it. It's like... <clears throat> okay, and that's going to be our first experiment. The second experiment like follows a very similar idea, but it's comparing a different quantity. So we are comparing here uh, this beta theta alg in a product x theta alg divided by 2n, uh, which is uh, highly related to the score function of this distribution. Uh, and we are comparing it with the theoretical counterpart. 
And this is like the outcome of our experiment. You can see those dashed lines, uh, these horizontal dashed lines represent the theoretical ideal for this quantity, and those uh, solid lines represent like the actual value we get using our experiments. And here x-axis is t, which you recall is the time index of the stochastic localization process. And this y-axis is basically like the theoretical and the empirical values we get. And those curves of different colors represent the result we get uh, under different values of beta. So from this plot, we can see that um, as t increases, the, um, the e e empirical results uh, is getting closer and closer to the theoretical ideal. And we actually do not need this t to be very large for our empirical results to um, approximate the theoretical value. So here I only take this t to be one, but of course if you take larger and larger t, you can imagine like this empirical stuff will basically converge with, like be consistent with the theoretical horizontal line, okay? And so that's basically uh, our second experiment, and here I conclude my talk. Thank you very much, that was very nice. And uh, you got some questions already, but we have time for one or two uh, more. Marco. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, can you comment a bit on the difficulty of sampling versus the difficulty of estimating the spike? Uh, I think sampling is like, to me, strictly difficult, more difficult than estimating the spike. But uh, if I can estimate the spike, then I can just plug in the estimate sample Gaussian noise since I know the, the distribution. So would, wouldn't that be enough? Uh, yeah, but it's like because First, you have to get an estimate of the spike, and this estimate of the spike has to achieve the, the Bayesian optimal, right? Because you have to like, get a consistent estimation of the posterior expectation. It's not like you can only just get some arbitrary correlation with the spike. So you're saying that this is, act so it's not enough to get perfect reconstruction. So say I do Rademacher, and mm -hmm. I am above the perfect reconstruction limit. That's actually oh, not perfect. enough to, to do the sampling. Oh, I think if you are above the perfect reconstruction limit, then of course you can. Uh, yeah, what I was just saying is like, you have to be able to consistently estimate the posterior expectation, but if you're already above the perfect construction limit, of course you can do that. I see, so you're saying if, if it's vanishing, that if I have a small gap, that, that small gap may screw me up. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any more questions right now, so let's thank uh, Sujin again. Thank you. And we move to the last talk.